happy Easter, everyone. I do admit it's a bummer that we all can't be together worshiping, but even though we can't celebrate Easter the way we normally do, it doesn't diminish the fact of what Jesus did for us. So I'm praying for all of us that we have joy amidst the upheaval that we're in right now, because what Jesus did didn't change, and that remains forever. In Philippians 3.20, Paul says that our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, as he ascended into heaven after he rose again, he is returning again, and that is our hope. And he promises that, and her pro his promises are yes and amen. And so I just want to encourage you that even though you may be celebrating different this year, we are one body, and it's one spirit that unites us. And nothing can take away from that fact. So God, I pray that as we worship you, and as we come together as a one body in one spirit, may your spirit unify us and help us to remember the real reason that we celebrate Easter. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you that our sins are forgiven. Thank you that you rose again, and our life is now hidden in you, Jesus. We love you. May you be glorified as we lift you up. May Jesus be lifted high as we sing together. Amen.
shines for God, thank you that our praise rises to you, that in your name there is victory. God, we commit this time to you. We thank you for the word that will be preached. May there be much fruit. Jesus, we love you, and we're so grateful, and we're so thankful for what you did. You died so that we may have life. God, we love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Easter to everyone. And it's an uh, interesting time we're living in with a pandemic in the world and uh, of facing all kinds of uh, situations. I mean, the world has always faced 
wars and plagues, and uh, this isn't new in that respect, but it's a first time that many of us have experienced anything like this, including just the fear of catching it, the fear of death. And uh, I probably should say, just in case you uh, don't know the difference between epidemic and pandemic, pandemic comes from a Greek word, pan meaning all, endemic meaning people. So it in simple terms, the Greek word just means all people. And, uh, and it's a word from the 17th century and was not actually hardly <laughs> used <laughs> until uh, more recently, obviously. And, and the thing with this virus, it's not something that we can see with our eyes. It's something that has thrown our world into this time of fear, anxiety, and even isolation. And so the COVID-19 has really turned our world upside down. And what better time for us to be talking about Jesus and Easter? So let's pray before we go any further. And we're going to be looking at the story of Jesus in the Gospel of John. You could be opening up your Bibles, your apps, and uh, swiping them to the Gospel of John, where we will anchor this morning and use that as our uh, story, our amazing story. So let's pray. So Jesus, we come. Father, thank you for sending him in flesh and blood, and, and uh, his story needs to become our story. And I pray, Lord, how can anyone capture in the depth of what it means that God would love us this much to send his only son. And we pray, I ask that you help me tell this story. I'm humbled to be able to tell it, excited, because Jesus, of you have made such a difference in the lives of millions of people. And I pray anyone listening this morning is impacted by who you are, especially in a troubled time in our world as this. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the world really is facing a pandemic, and we're experiencing it and seeing the effects of it uh, around us with our eyes. But what I want to do is take that idea of pandemic because the world has faced and continues to face several pandemics uh, even now. And Jesus offers himself as the cure. The cure gives us courage, and with the courage in Christ, we find this peace that we can offer a troubled world. And that's really what I want us to understand this morning is that there's always been pandemics, but they're spiritual, and maybe we have not even been aware of them. And so there's three of them I want us to look at in the Gospel of John. And let's just begin with the reading of John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. It says, In the beginning... Now you're thinking, wait a second, that sounds like Genesis. It's supposed to sound like Genesis. John is giving us a new creation, but this one is spiritual. And it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He, he, the Word, it's talking about Jesus Christ. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus was responsible for the creation. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and listen, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's kind of personifying darkness, and that's because it's intentional. The first pandemic that we need to be aware of is the tyranny of Satan and sin. And so this is our first pandemic, that there is a spiritual evil force, the devil, and, and always in close association with the devil, like in the garden itself in the creation the serpent shows up to tempt adam and eve to sin to not trust their creator 
And, and what is the need? With every pandemic, there's a need, and what's needed is freedom and forgiveness. And so it all begins in the first pages of Genesis, and it begins in the first page of John. And Jesus is coming as the light to oppose the darkness. And the good news is what is being said is the darkness will not be o- able to overcome the light. And that is the building up of the Easter message, the thing we need to understand. And if we turn over to John 8, we can see more of this idea of the tyranny of Satan and sin. And in John 8, verses 31 through 36, we read, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Does that sound familiar? Sometimes you can see it engraved in the stone in, uh, in university institutions. But Jesus is saying something more than just knowledge sets us free. Because even after centuries of amazing education and learning and science, we do not find ourselves any more free today as a people than we were back then and face just as many struggles and trials inside our hearts. So Jesus goes on to say, or say, or actually in response to him saying, and the truth will set you free, verse 33, they answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will be, that you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so Jesus is offering himself as the cure to forced servitude that Satan and sin puts upon us. You ever thought about that? As much as we think we're free agents, we all serve somebody. Isn't it Bob Dylan who says, but you got to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. And that, in Bob's words, is true. That's the first pandemic. What's the second one? Well, it's death. And what's the need? Well, that one's obvious. Life. But everybody dies. And that's why the need is more than life. The need is eternal life. So let's read John 3.16. Or maybe you all know it by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not, what? Die. But have eternal life in him. And John 11, verses 25 and 26, we read, I, Jesus said to her, and her is, Ma- is Martha, and Martha and Mary, in this story, their brother Lazarus has died. And when Jesus came, he was already um, very <laughs> dead and in a tomb. And, uh, and Martha uh, comes to him in her despair, as Mary will later. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So those who die, if they they believe in Jesus, shall live and have eternal life and be taken up into a new heaven and earth is what he's talking about. In verse 26, he goes on to say, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And so that is the promise, that is the cure. And Jesus says, do you believe this? My professor, D.A. Carson, said, death is an enemy. It can be a fierce one. It is ugly. It destroys relationships. It is to be feared. It is repulsive. There is something odious about death. Never pretend otherwise. But death does not have the last word. Thank God for a Savior who could claim, I am the resurrection and the life. 
can I hear an amen through the TV? Um, so that's the second pandemic, and let's look at the third. And this one is isolation from God. We're all experiencing in real time an isolation, but there has always been a spiritual pandemic of isolation from God because of that sin. And what's needed? Intimacy through Christ. So we turning back to chapter 1, where we read of the spir- a new spiritual creation, we read something very encouraging. Verse 12 of chapter 1. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And so there's this promise of intimacy, a promise of spiritual adoption to be sons and daughters simply if we believe in his name and receive him into our lives. And we read again Jesus in Jesus' own words in chapter 14, the same idea. And it's now these words, what he's saying, it's kind of like, whoa, it's hard to get your mind around. But listen carefully in verses 18 through 20. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, those who have put their faith in him. And he says to them, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And in that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. I know that's like, what? But what's he's saying is there is the ultimate relationship closeness intimacy between the father the son and you when you and i believe in him so what are the spiritual pandemics you are facing in your life i mean we're living a re- one in real time but spiritually we are too and ask in in what ways is what are you feeling in your, uh, is there some area in your life where you find yourself serving Satan and giving in to his temptations? Are you experiencing anxiety or death because of this time we're in? And realizing that you maybe you're missing out on intimacy with God. Before we look at the cure, because these are, pandemics in the need but before we look at the cure i just want to remind us of some very precious words jesus said in chapter 10 verses 10 through 11 he says the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy and so the satan is a subtractor of life sometimes we pursue things and not realize he's in the midst of it, actually subtracting the things we're seeking. And so the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He's offering himself as the cure. And not just, I'm offering you an okay life or a half full life. This is a life overflowing. Because it's a spiritual life in connection with the cure. And he says in verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. So now he turns to a metaphor. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, he who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. I am the good shepherd. And so in all these things, Jesus hasn't told us how, but he's offering himself as a cure. But he, al- he understands what it means to be human. And, and also, as we go through these things, I have had my own experiences even through this pandemic uh, where I find myself kind of getting rattled and uh, realizing that, that Satan, the thief, is trying to take from me. And, and that happened 
actually not just a few weeks ago when Jesus, or not Jesus, Jill, <laughs> and Jill comes down the stairs and she's like, hey, did you hear? They, ha- they have possibly found a treatment for COVID-19 and it's hydroxychloroquine. Now, I instantly knew what that is, that drug, uh, because I also know there's another name for it called Plaquenil. And anybody that has lupus knows that drug because it's a drug that helps keep us alive. It's the treatment for this lupus, this disease in us, where our our systems attacks itself, our immune system. And and it's, man, it's, it's constant fever, it's weakness, it's pain, and ultimately, you know, the organs shut down. And so when I heard that, I was not excited. I instantly <laughs> went on the phone. I grabbed my Plaquenil subscription, and I called the, you know, the, phone, the automated phone line to get a refill quickly. And, it, and I was so encouraged that, okay, it went through. It says it's going to be ready tomorrow. And then I was like, whoa, because I knew instantly the world's going to be, you know, s- trying to get a hold of this. And it's like, man, I need this. And so sure enough, the next day I get a call from the pharmacist saying they're only going to f- fill a third of my prescription. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, that's not going to last very long, as you can hear. And it's like, w- what happens? Because she was saying that's needed because of this pandemic this uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine. And, she, and I, she goes, well, I'm hoping we'll be able to refill it. And at that point, I'm getting panicked. And I'm like, um, do you understand that I will die a slow death <laughs> if you don't refill this? She goes, I understand. We'll do our best. We'll call around. And it's like it wasn't really reassuring. And in that moment, I realized, yep, sh- Fear had crept in. But what did we just read about the shepherd? There's a wolf out there, and he wants to take away your faith in Jesus. He wants to replace it with fear. He wants to kill hope in you. He wants to destroy your relationship with Christ. And I remembered something. The Latin word for lupus comes from the word wolf. And I knew that my ultimate cure is not in Plaquenil, but in Christ. Amen. So the cure comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ, but it comes to us in two different events. First, there's the crucifixion. And second, there's the resurrection. Easter is empty without understanding if we also don't look at crucifixion. So be turning now to John chapter 19. And let's look at the cure. First, the cure is Jesus' crucifixion. And this deals with the first pandemic of the tyranny of Satan and sin, the need for freedom and forgiveness. And so... In chapter 19, we find Jesus on the cross. And and you ever hung on someone's, maybe a relative or someone famous, and actually their last words were recorded? And, don't, and, and, and it's like, well, what would be the last words of someone knowing they're about to breathe their last breath? Well, in the Gospel of Mark, we read, it says uh, in verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. So he, he had this loud cry. But what was that? It could be the cry we find in John 19, verses 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill scripture, I thirst. A jar of sour wine stood there, so they put a a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus received the sour wine, he said, It is finished! And bowed his head 
and gave up his spirit. When I started praying about what the Lord wanted for this Easter to be spoken, I kept coming to that line, it is finished. Now, maybe <laughs> it was simply because, man, I can't wait for this pandemic to be over with and finished. I, you know, it could be that. But I think there was something more, far more important than the end of the pandemic that the Lord is wanting us to understand this morning in his death. You see, that those it's three words, it is finished. But actually, in the Greek, it's only one word. He yelled out one word that we translate into it is finished. Yet that one word has such depth of meaning that it took three in our English to capture it. And let's explore that a little more. Because the meaning of it is not Jesus going, man, I'm finished. I'm I'm a I'm a dead man. And it's also not, it's finally over, man. I get, get to go back to heaven. That's not what that word means. This word means it is accomplished. It is completed. It's like the worker who says to the boss, I've completed all the work you've given me to do. It's, it's like the surgeon who says at the end of a successful operation, we are finished here. It's, it's the judge who tells the person the debt is paid in full. It is finished. There's no more debt to be paid. It's the general of, of the army saying when the war is won, it's over. There's victory. And, and that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus, the son, is saying to the father, and you can actually read his words in John 17, verse 4. He says, I, speaking to the Father, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. You, we can almost see the smile on a proud father's face to hear his son speak those words. It's Jesus, the physician, who says to those who are sick with sin, you are healed. And we can hear on our own lips Words of gratitude that he has healed us. It's Jesus, the judge, saying to the condemned, you are forgiven and I have taken the punishment. And you can hear a sigh of relief of all those who know that they're guilty. It's Jesus, the king of glory, saying to Satan, and not from a tank, but from a cross saying, your tyranny is over. You're finished. And we all know that Satan and his evil horde are running for the hills to hide from those words it is finished. I don't know. I want to say hallelujah because, man, that's what Jesus means when he says it is finished. And when he says it is finished, it was finished in the past. It is still finished in the present. And it will remain finished in the future. It is a victory cry. This is a victory cry of our forgiveness and our freedom. So Jesus, the cure of Jesus in the crucifixion. But did you notice that cure deals with our first pandemic. But there's two more besides the tyranny of Satan and sin remaining. And so now we move to the cure is Jesus' resurrection. And this takes care of the pandemic of s death and the need for eternal life and isolation from God where we now can have intimacy with God through Christ. And, and so we find in the, in the gospel, well, actually, let me just, before I do that, let me just read in uh, chapter 20, the first verse 11 of our passage this morning, because we'll be reading verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, 
because Jesus was buried, crucified, and they laid him in a tomb. And she went there after he had been in the tomb three days um, to help with his preparation for burial. And, and, sh and she found this tomb to be empty. And Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and, she and as she wept, she stooped to look in the tomb. And like the many churches that are empty, the good news is the tomb was empty too. And the thing I want you to understand about Mary, this is Mary Magdalene, who was one of those who had been uh, on a hill in a distance watching the crucifixion of Jesus. But we find her in the Gospel of Luke, and we learn a little bit more about her because Mary had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. She had lived, can you imagine the kind of life she lived that opened up the door because we, it's a life we live that makes ourselves accessible to the attack of Satan and, and things that happen to us even outside of our choosing that opens the door and seven dark servants of hell took control of her life. And imagine, you know, the, the destroying work of the devil in her life and the, the physical and emotional, spiritual pain he was causing her to, his ultimate goal is to take the glory away from God, which is our relationship with the Lord. But Jesus took her out of that darkness and brought her into her, his light. Jesus took her out of her isolation and offered her a true friendship and the love of God the Father. So you can understand why she would be at this tomb weeping, because she still needed a savior. The one she had anchored all her future hope in seemed to be gone. She was consumed at this time with her problems and distracted. She, of, and she almost missed an opportunity to have a, di a deeper relationship with Christ because of these distractions. I mean, we're all experiencing isolation in one way or another right now and because of the virus. But it's not all so bad, is it? You know, with no more race cars and sports to watch, you know, I, have, I've, I had a long conversation with my wife, and she seems very nice. If we can turn off the TV and, and get the distractions out of the way, we might find ourselves in a deeper conversation with the Lord, with God, and find out he's very amazing. And so we read on in this passage, and let's read it now. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, and one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Notice she's still weeping. And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She's so lost in her troubles. I mean, if, if you or I saw two angels, we'd be like, if we didn't fall flat on our face in fear, we'd be like, wow, we'd be shocked out of it. But this just shows how deep we can spiral into our darkness. And they said to her, why are, are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord. I do not know where they've laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, he repeats the same question. Woman, why are you weeping? She's still weeping. She couldn't even recognize him. Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said and that he had said all these things to her.
what I want us to really anchor onto is that Jesus, in asking her why you are weeping, he's repeating a question, and and he's trying to draw her into a, a, a place where she could recognize the cure is standing right in front of her. But he doesn't stop like the angels. Just you know, it's you know, it's almost like almost a mild rebuke. Why are you weeping? But he goes on to say. Whom are you seeking? He adds that question. He's adding a profound question to encourage some deeper reflection about herself, her situation, what is her relationship with Jesus. It's profound. But her mind is so stuck on the problem, and, and she resists his gentle prodding to look a little higher than her fears. What are those fears, anxieties? What are those emotions that sometimes, like me, man, I, I forget to look up because I'm looking down? And so with the gentle word of Mary, he pulls her out of her persistent or persevering blindness to his presence. And so what is she, what's her, I can understand her response. All she's known is a, a physical Savior, and so she clings to him. You know, she she's. It's like I'll never let you go. I can't. I can't live my life without you. And there's that flood of anxiety and fear. And it's like, and he. It's almost like he has to wrench her hands away from her. And he says he. He actually. It's a mild rebuke, but he rebukes her. Do not hold on to me. Because she's trying to cling to his physical presence. And he knows there's a, a, such a greater spiritual blessing in his ascension back to the Father. So here's the point. In, in Jesus telling Mary to not cling to him, he is telling her that what she needs most cannot be found in Jesus physically remaining on this earth. But what she really needs in all of us is to believe in a spiritual relationship with God that is far more profound and personal, a relationship that nothing can interfere or take it away from us as long as we put our faith in him and his faith in his love. And it's going to happen, Jesus says, through the coming of his Holy Spirit. So Jesus cannot send the Holy Spirit, our helper, our comforter, you know, our advocate until he ascends into heaven. And the Holy Spirit then helps make that home in our hearts so that we can have a much deeper and profound relationship with Christ. And so that's the first key is to not cling to him, but to seek him. Who is it? you've been seeking what is it you've been seeking in these times and it's like my story you know with the lupus my eyes went off him and I had to and it wasn't until late I realized I need to seek the true cure but the second key in the crucifixion story are the words peace be with you and we find this as Jesus then meets in chapter 20 with his disciples. And it's kind of interesting because we won't, we won't read the passage, but we find that the disciples are practicing social distancing out of fear in a locked door because they're afraid of dying like you and I, but in this case by the hands of those who hate Jesus. And so they're, they're doing their social distancing from the rest of the world. But Jesus, now being both physical and spiritual, can pass through that door and he says to them peace be with you and then we read in chapter 20 another time he comes to them and again says the same words peace be with you and now look at verses or verse 26 of chapter 20 and there was one of the disciples that was not present when Jesus appeared those two times, and it was Thomas. We all know doubting Thomas. The world uses that. Oh, he's a doubting Thomas. She's a doubting Thomas. Well, this is the story. And so Thomas said, unless he could see, touch, feel, 
his crucified hands and, you know, put his hand aside, he wouldn't believe. And, and so he had, his heart was turning to unbelief. And in verse 26, it says, Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. That word peace in the Greek is the same word we find in the Old Testament, shalom. And it's a very powerful word. It's not a warm sentiment saying, man, I hope you're happy. This is a profound, it's a, it's, it's a one-word prayer that things will be the way they ought to be between you and God. It's a blessing. It's a prayer saying, let things be right with you and God. Let it be everything, that, that relationship that God desires for you. So three times, peace be with you. You see, death for believers is not a door that closes. Death is a door like the tomb that opens to eternal life. My uh, daughter, uh, Selena, was shared a story about at her company. The, the boss, in reference to the coronavirus, said, what's the worst thing that can happen? You die. If you're okay with dying, then it's not so bad. <laughs> I, I love that attitude. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we should deeply care about dying, but that fear of it disappears when we have a faith in Christ. But let's talk about Thomas now. In, uh, in verse 27, we read, Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here. And see my hands and put your hand and place it in my side where he was pierced with a spear. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, you have believed because you've seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know, we can't, I can anyway, really fault Thomas for struggling with belief because he couldn't see. And, and Jesus wasn't rebuking him <coughs> for his lack of not seeing him because Jesus had already appeared to Mary and to all the disciples, and he wanted Thomas to see him too. But he didn't want Thomas's believing to be anchored on, you know, uh, proof of, of what he could see and touch. And, and Jesus, like this virus, it's like, can we really see him? And, and, I'm rem and I'm just thinking about how because of the greatest need there is for us to keep things sterile, especially, you know, the parents. Man, you can imagine how difficult it is right now for parents with little kids. And so when the kids are called in, you know, one time when was some children were called in for dinner and the mother said, go wash your hands, the little boy scowled and said, Germs in Jesus, germs in Jesus. That's all I ever hear, but I never see either one of them. <laughs> and so my point is, there's a lot of things that we can't see that we believe, and certainly don't let Jesus be one of those things. I love science. I love the universe. And do you know that we know, we strongly believe there's something called the black hole. And black holes, but we can't detect them with the most powerful x-rays, um, light or other forms of electromagnetic radiation. You can, however, infer the presence of black holes by the effect they have on planets and stars around them. So I totally believe in black holes, though we cannot see them. And that's the same with Christ. That's why Jesus said that we are blessed when we do not anchor our relationship with a physical Jesus, but when we believe in a spiritual one. How do you do that? Well, sometimes because we've come at a scientific age, we say, I won't believe unless in Jesus unless someone can prove it without a doubt. But what if you change your starting point? What if instead you say, I will choose to believe in Jesus until someone can prove that he doesn't exist? And in doing that, if you try that, as many have, saying, I'm going to believe until the opposite, someone proves that it's not true, 
and they begin to experience a Savior. They begin to experience through the Holy Spirit the presence of God in them that they know even in the face of death they will not deny is real. It has been said the most outrageous doubter of the resurrection of Jesus, which was Thomas, utters the greatest confession of the Lord who rose from the dead. This is Jesus Christ. And that's why Peter, one of his other disciples, in chapter 1, verse 8, says to you, this is Peter speaking to the church, you and me, he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's been my experience. How about yours? So, in closing, what are the spiritual pandemics that you are facing right now? How can you seek the one who offers peace let's pray and maybe you want to make this I'll put it in a first person and you can make it your own prayer with me help me Jesus not shape you according to my doubts fears and uncertainties I believe help me with my unbelief so that I will trust you and follow you Lord I pray that the trials you do allow in my life that make me uncomfortable will remind me who it is I need to seek. You are Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You are the one that has overcome the tyranny of Satan and sin. You are the one that brings us eternal life because you were willing to, to surrender yours on a cross. You are the one that opens the door to intimacy with the Father in heaven because as the moment we trust in you, we become adopted as sons and daughters. Give me the courage to share this peace with the world and that you're the cure to the true pandemics. In Jesus' name, amen.